Welcome to the first webinar in the Winter 2019 Northern Grapes Project Series. Uh, my name is Janet Van Zorn. I'm the support specialist for the New York Statewide Viticulture Extension Program, and I'll be your moderator and will provide technical support today. A quick announcement that the next webinar in this series will be on January 17th, discussing the impact of fruit zone sunlight exposure on fruit composition with Amaya Atucha from the University of Wisconsin. We'll provide more information about registering for that at the end of today's talk. So to start off today, you can open the chat bar if you haven't already. Um, that's located at the bottom of your screen, and you can use that for introducing yourself, making any comments, and to alert me if you're having technical difficulties. Just change the chat setting to send to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your introduction. If you'd like to ask questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A button on the menu at the bottom of your screen. We'll have some time in the middle and at the end of the presentation to address these questions, but you can type them in at any time during the talk. Additionally, Jose Ramon will provide his email address so you can email him directly to ask any vineyard specific questions or any that we don't get to today. Our speaker today is Jose Ramon Urbes Torres. He is a research, research scientist at the Summerlin Summerland Research and Development Center in British Columbia, Canada. His area of expertise includes bacterial, fungal, and viral diseases of woody perennial crops, including grapevines. He has a wealth of knowledge and hands-on experience researching grapevine trunk diseases, and I'm looking forward to an informative presentation. And with that, I'll now turn it over to Jose Ramon. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Can you, right. can you see my presentation? Yep, that looks good. Can you all hear me right? Yeah? Yes, okay. I think everyone can. So thank you very much. Uh, good morning here in British Columbia. Good afternoon in the East. And I don't know somewhere else they are joining us probably in the evening. I saw some people joining from the UK actually. So it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And um, today I will be talking about uh, grapevine trunk diseases. I will give uh, an overview of uh, all these uh, diseases. So as an outline, uh, first, as I mentioned, a brief overview, what are these diseases, some of the symptoms. Uh, I will give some information about the uh, studies, actually uh, quite a lot of studies done in cool or cold regions. Uh, then I thought we will have a break after this point and go with the other two uh, main parts of the presentation, talking about the epidemiology of the diseases and finally with the management. So um, grapevine trunk diseases are caused by many different uh, fungal pathogens. Uh, most of them are in the Ascomicota, but we have some basidiomycetes, what we know as the mushroom-like uh, fungi that are also involved in this uh, uh, complex. Uh, one of the most characteristic things of these uh, diseases is they are going to infect the vine through any type of openings and wounds. And as you know, we have to prune grapes every year, so pruning wounds are the most uh, common point of entry. But any other type of wounds caused by mechanical damage, retraining, uh, can be also a point of entry for these pathogens. We are now studying also uh, another area of research where um, we are trying to understand if these uh, fungi are also part of what we know as endophytes or latent pathogens. Sometimes we find this uh, fungi uh, in asymptomatic uh, boot with no symptoms, and I will talk a little bit uh, about that later. So the symptoms include uh, a slow, rapid, or sudden vine decline, and this will depend on the disease and also on the different pathogens we have involved, uh, and actually, of course, the death of the plant. So these fungal pathogens are like us humans. They need food to survive and to grow. So where are they getting their food uh, source from the wood? All the carbohydrates that we have uh, on, the, on the wood, they are the food source for these pathogens. So grapevine trunk diseases can be now divided in two main groups. Those that are affecting what we call young vineyards and the ones uh, in, uh, affecting mature vineyards. What a young or a mature vineyard, you know, de depending on age, I think depends also in the area we are. You know, for example, I would say in a normal Mediterranean temperate climate up to 
five years old, you know, a, a young vineyard. Uh, after the year four, we usually have a full crop. Here, for example, in British Columbia, I would say that the young vineyard would be still a six, seven, or eight years old. So the diseases that affect young vines are known as blackfoot and petri disease, and this is just an example of the different genus eh, uh, that um, fungi are uh, associated with these diseases. In mature vineyards, we have the ESCA complex, I will talk a little bit later, and then the dieback or decline diseases with botrytis fire dieback, Eutypha dieback, and Formosis dieback. So starting with young vineyards, eh, the foliar and external symptoms we usually see are um, loss of vigor. Uh, we can see a general decline where sometimes, you know, uh, plants have a, a problems to thrive or they don't even grow or have any spring, spring growth. Uh, characteristic symptoms are uh, short internodes or even during the growing season, we can see a sudden collapse of the vine. As we can see here, uh, these symptoms are not really easy to associate with uh, jump vine decline, mostly if we are, for example, in a cool or cold climate region, as they look alike sometimes as, for example, winter kill or even frost, uh, uh, spring frost. However, internally, we can see very clear how uh, the symptoms look for these jump vines. We have all this uh, streaking of the boot, this dark discoloration, uh, usually starting at the at the bottom of, of the rootstock or the self-rooted variety uh, and all these different um, necrotic uh, areas in the in the plant. These are the fungi associated with the decline of young vines. I'm not gonna uh, try to go through all of them but just to give you the information that they are very complex. There are a wide number of different fungi. Primary, Phaemoniella chlamydospora. Uh, Phacremonium minimum in the group of over, you know, almost 30 Phacremonium species associated with the complex. We have two main black food pathogens. These are soil-borne pathogens, Dactylonetia macrodima, Dolecta urendri, and also very commonly found in young plants are Cadophora, Lutolibacea, and Devotiosphaeria species, Diploia seriata. In mature vineyards, as I mentioned before, we have the ESCA complex eh, and all the dieback eh, decline diseases. The ESCA complex is caused also for similar eh, or the same number of pathogens that the Petri disease, as I mentioned before. One of the main difference with the ESCA is we have the association also of basidiomycetes, eh, well, I mentioned before, the mushroom type eh, fungi. Some of the symptoms we see with mature, uh, immature vines with ESCA is the foliar symptoms, what we call the leaf tiger stripes. They are very characteristic and actually easy to spot in the vineyard. We have all this scorching, uh, intervallian scorching uh, of the leaves. Uh, and then we have uh, in the fruit what we call as black measles. Uh, and we can see all these necrotic areas. Uh, these are caused uh, by secondary metabolites or toxins produced by the, by the fungi that they get translocated and expressed in the fruit. This is a significant problem for table grape growers. As you can imagine, the fruit cannot be uh, market. Internally, uh, ESCA uh, vascular symptoms, these are very characteristic to observe all these um, silent plaque necrosis, all these uh, areas in the wood. Uh, sometimes we can see even uh, the, the canker forming, but this is one of the most characteristic symptoms of ESCA, and it's this yellowish spongy uh, boot uh, that we can actually, is very soft, uh, and this is because of the association uh, with the basidiomycetes. Compared to the other different fungi, these basidiomycetes, they consume the lignin, which is the, the, the strongest cell wall of the, of the plant, and we start seeing all this decay. Sometimes it's very common even to see the fruiting bodies eh, of these uh, uh, basidomyces outside on the, on the boot. One symptom very characteristic of ESCA and still not very well understood is what we call the sudden collapse or apoplexy. Uh, vines in the middle of the growing season will completely collapse. This can happen within two or three days. Uh, and all the leaves will fall and the, the berries are shriveled. And that's what is, is known as apoplexy. Another disease of mature vineyards is Eutypha dieback, also long time known. And it's very characteristic for its foliar symptoms, which usually are these very short internodes, this cup 
uh, leaves. Sometimes you can observe necrosis on the on the leaves. And uh, in this um, suit, there is a complete abortion of the clusters. So again, these symptoms have been shown to be caused by secondary metabolites or toxins produced by the fungus Utai palata, that they get translocated eh, through the vascular symptom and affecting uh, the foliage. These are the typical internal symptoms, these cankers, these web-shaped cankers eh, that colonize the, the wood. The fungi associated with Utaipa dieback, eh, for a long time, eh, we only knew Utaipa lata, but recently these are all the different species within the Diatripaceae family that are associated with the disease. Uh, Utai palata is uh, still the main pathogen and so far the only one that has been demonstrated to cause these foliar symptoms. These are the fruiting bodies uh, structures of Utai palata. Eh? The peritisia uh, are, are named where all these acai with the spores are inside. Eh? These are the characteristic spores of Utai palata. Potriosferia dieback, the other uh, disease affecting mature vineyards. Um, we can see that the internal symptoms also causing cankers are very similar, almost indistinguishable from those of Utaipa uh, dieback. However, one of the things we can differentiate Utaipa from Potriosferia dieback is the lack of foliage symptoms. This is very characteristic of Potriosferia dieback to see the cordon or spur positions of the vine with no spring uh, growth, uh, no, no green growth. And here, for example, we can see that probably the canker uh, entering some of these pruning wounds, and we can see here the canker progressing. But still, in the other areas of the vine, we can still see um, a healthy shoot. Another symptom that we can uh, isolate the Botryosphaeria species are all these streaking uh, of the wood, and of course, as the canker progresses, you know, all the spur positions or the framework of the vine. Um, they get, uh, they, they die, and that's one of the reasons we don't see these foliar symptoms. The fungi associated with uh, Utaipa, uh, with Botryosphaeria dieback, sorry, again, a very large number of different species in the Botryosphaeria I see. Contrary to Utaipa uh, dieback, Botryosphaeria, the protein bodies are known as pignidia, they are the asexual stage, and they can see here they are embedded on the, on the bark, and we have a, a hole where all the spores are, are released. And this is just an example of two of the species of Botryosphaeria commonly found in vineyards, uh, the spores as well as the fungal columns. Last, uh, we have uh, Formopsis dieback, eh? and the symptoms are basically indistinguishable from those of Botryosphaeria dieback. We have web-shaped cankers, we have all the spur positions of the cordons with no uh, uh, specific foliar symptoms associated, Fruiting bodies can be found on the wood or also in vines that have been affected by Pomopsis cane and leaf spot. This species causing Pomopsis dieback is the same species causing Pomopsis cane and leaf spot, Pomopsis viticola. Out of these fruiting bodies, we can see here a cirrus, so these are the spores eh, uh, attached that they get released, and this is just the, the common colony of Pomopsis. So this uh, Formosis dieback has been recently uh, uh, described as a, as a disease and is most prevalent, of course, in regions where we have high Formosis cane and leaf spot disease pressure. So if we go back of what we knew about the species of trans diseases in 2000, we have 15 different fungal species belonging to 10 genera. Today we have uh, close to 130 fungal species belonging to 34 genera, and this also has been thanks to the new molecular detection techniques that we can identify and uh, discriminate among many of these pathogens. And uh, still we have a, a number of uh, fungi that are recently been associated, for example, in the Cytospora. As we know, Cytospora is also a fungi that causes cankers on fruit trees, mostly apples, cherries, have been also associated with grapevine cankers. Fusarion, this has been recent studies that we have found Fusarion associated also with the declining and young vines, but still, I said associated because it's still more research that needs to be completed to really understand the role that these species have on the symptoms development. Not all the fungi described, you know, have been complete what we call the Cox postulates, where we need to prove that the fungal that we isolated from the symptom is the actually causal agent of the symptom when we artificially inoculate those plants. So it's important to know that grapevine trans diseases are not uh, recent or something that it has been just discovered. 
And we thought actually they are as old as by cultivation. Eh? There are some um, publications where they refer to escalate symptoms in Greek, Latin, or even medieval work. But actually, the first uh, uh, study, the first confirmation of a grapevine trans disease is uh, from France in the end of the 19th century, where we're describing the symptoms of foyetage and even apoplexy, the sudden collapse I showed you before. Uh, by the same time, in the early 1900s, a lot of studies were done in New York, eh, studying the dead arm disease caused by Formosis viticola. And in 1912, it was the first time that actually Lionel Petri was able to reproduce the symptoms of early ESCA when inoculated uh, healthy vines with some of the pathogens he found. So why the emerging uh, of grapevine trans diseases? So this is a description that I uh, obtained from the National Institute of Health of what an emerging disease is. Have occurred previously, but effectively only a small population in isolated places or have occurred throughout human history, but have only recently been recognized as a distinct disease due to different factors. And within the grapevine trans disease community, this is what we think really is happening with grapevine trans diseases. They have been happening for a long time, but for different reasons, you know, we have started seeing major outbreaks in early 2000. Some of the hypotheses we have are changes that we have seen in viticulture practices. This is a vineyard on my hometown in Spain, Zaragoza. These are almost 100 year old Garnacha vines. And this is still, uh, in many areas, uh, very common how we grow grapes. Very low density planting, uh, head train vines, very few spur positions. Uh, and now we are more and more uh, developing trellis systems, double cordons. As I mentioned before, these pathogens primary in fed grace through pruning wounds. So we are actually creating, you know, an opportunity in our vineyards. If we multiply the number of spur positions by the number of pruning wounds that we do in each of these cordons, we can see the, the, the chance that these patients have to infect vines. Uh, we think also that maybe some of these outbreaks are due to the prohibition or phase out of some of the effective chemical control we have previously, like sodium arsenide or the phase out of nedomil in 2001, and as well as some of the planting booms, you know, uh, that um, resulted in poor quality planting material. It's interesting to see because uh, if we go back to uh, what happened in viticulture from 1980 to basically today, we have actually observed a decrease in the amount of acreage planting around the world. In 1980, we have about 9 million uh, hectares of grace. Today, we have about 7 million hectares of grace in the world. But this planting will refer mostly, for example, uh, what we call viticulture in the new world. Yeah? Uh, it has been uh, massive plantings after the 1980s, uh, early 1990s. A changing of varieties. This created, you know, the need of a lot of planting material uh, and the demand was not there. So that's one of the thoughts that we think we have poor quality planting material. However, we don't really know yeah, if uh, these factors are really the cause that we see these major outbreaks, but this is just some explanations that actually we don't really have scientific proof. What is true is the grapevine trans diseases are causing a significant increase in management costs. These are two studies, one done in California where grape growers actually are spending over 260 millions a year to fight against trans diseases. A study by Trevor Wicks and Davis in 1999 showed that only one disease, Utaipa, in only white variety, Chira, in Australia were costing about 20 million per year. More recently, and this is our studies from France in 2014, they saw that ESCA has been categorized actually as a crisis in France and overall in Europe. In France, they estimate that about 12% of the French vineyards are right now economically unviable, and over 100,000 hectares affected, which you know, cost about 1 billion euros. So it's a significant issue and a problem um, across Europe. Recently, a very nice study is coming from uh, California with Dr. Kaplan Harson, you know, the progress of the disease, you know, and this is, for example, the disease incidence in symptomatic vines, uh, how the grapevine trans disease progresses. By year 10, we can have about 20% of our vines infected if we don't do really anything to fight against these diseases. 
by year 15, we can get up to 80% of infection in our vineyards. This translated into the <coughs> uh, yield. That would be the ideal, have a constant yield over the lifespan of our vineyard. But we can see that by the time we have over 10% and 20% infection, our yield actually can decrease 20%. By year 15, they have shown that our yields can decrease up to 80% if we don't do anything against uh, trans diseases. So grapevine trans disease studies eh, show that they occur wherever grapes are grown and they estimate a worldwide economic impact in 1.5 billion US dollars. However, I think this study underestimate a bit as this um, um, 1.5 billion comes to the cost of replacing 1% of the vines currently uh, infected with uh, uh, trans diseases, which as we know, in many areas, the, the vines uh, infected are way higher than uh, <clears throat> 1%. So moving to the second point, Greenman trans disease in cool, cold regions. So as I mentioned before, it has been long known, you know, of these diseases happening uh, in uh, cool regions of Northeast United States. And it's very interesting that many of these studies for some reason have been, uh, I wouldn't say ignored, but not really paid attention that they should uh, be. But actually, most of the research on trans diseases started, you know, in Northeast United States, uh, mostly uh, primary in New York, with the first studies of Reddick uh, Sear, uh, describing how Fomopsis viticola was catching what they call dead arm. They describe symptoms that we call today you type a, a dieback, but just fire dieback or Fomopsis dieback. <laughs> uh, in the 1970s, uh, Utai Parata was described and first found in New York and Ontario, uh, and that triggered a lot of studies uh, on this particular disease on epidemiology in con and control. At the same time, there was a lot of studies on Utai or in California as well as in Australia, and it became actually the main grapevine trans disease uh, study. Most recently, in 2007, eh, uh, myself with my colleague, George Lavitt, uh, conducted field surveys in Northeast United States, and we described for the first time what was area. So we knew that not only Utai palata or Fomosis viticola were associated with these diseases in um, uh, cool regions. In 2011, a very large study that actually surveyed most of the states, eh, including some of the great growing regions in Canada, they discovered most of the species affecting black food uh, disease. And as you can see, eh, in the last five, six years, a lot of studies coming uh, reporting grapevine trans diseases in many areas eh, in Northeast United States, including uh, up to 15 different fungal pathogens were identified in Missouri and Arkansas, diaporte species, cadophora species, and most recently, cytospora species. <laughs> In 2007, eh, we reported for the first time eh, uh, grapevine trans disease in Oregon. Uh, as you can see, I mentioned here cool or cold grape growing regions. You know, some of these regions we can consider cool regions. Um, and that's how I'm going to be referring uh, for now. In 2015, first fungi reported in Washington. And actually, that's interesting to see how they observe how the disease rate was increasing with the age eh, of the vineyards. Eh? At higher the, the age, higher disease rate in Washington. <laughs> Since 2010, we have been conducting a lot of studies in British Columbia on grapevine trans diseases. We have done large surveys eh, with more than 60,000 vines inspected visually eh, and more than 500 symptomatic samples collected. So our results show that 90 5% of surveyed vineyards presented grapevine trans diseases. However, the disease incidence per vineyard varies significantly between the 2 and 80%. So we could see two main points, Jan vines infected, mostly with we know the Jan vine decline. British Columbia is a, you know, um, Jan and region with a lot of plantings coming in the last uh, 10 years. And we can see up to 40% infection in some of these uh, vineyards. Builder high incidence, of course, as you know, previously presented, as the vineyards uh, age, we are observing a higher incidence with up to 80%, uh, between 60-80% in some of the vineyards. So right now we have estimated that 
A little bit over 10% of vines in British Columbia are infected with grapevine tran diseases. We have identified over 42 different fungi, and the industry right now has identified tran disease as the most important disease uh, limiting the lifespan of vineyard skin disease. So grapevine tran diseases are present and important in coal uh, growing regions, not only in North America. More and more studies are coming in uh, coal regions in, in, in Europe as well as in some regions in China. And for a very long time, trans disease has been actually recognized as a big problem in New Zealand. And you know, we can consider some of these regions in New Zealand also cool, cool regions. So why we think that this trans disease has been paid less attention in some of these regions? Well, talking with many people uh, I know from some of these regions, one of the main things they talk is because vines are retrained with greater frequency due to winter injury, so we are actually performing a non-target vine surgery, elimination of the grapevine tran disease infected food. We can see here eh, pictures taken from my colleague, George Lavet in New York, this uh, multi-trunk, eh, how you know, trans were cut. So we are basically eliminating the disease from the field. However, this retraining doesn't happen in all these regions at the same frequency eh, or not happen at all. If we consider, for example, British Columbia as a cool region, we don't have almost any retraining. Uh, additionally, most of our grapes are grafted, are not self-rooted, so actually retraining uh, becomes uh, quite of a, of a problem. However, we still think that petri disease and blackfoot, the soil, uh, soil-borne pathogens on jam, plant, on, on jam vines, can be of significant importance in the establishment of new vineyards in these regions. Another thing is cold hardy varieties are thought to be less susceptible. However, unfortunately, we don't have very much information about the susceptibility of these varieties to grapevine tran diseases. Some studies have shown that Concord uh, has been well shown to be susceptible to Utah palata and Fomoxis viticola. And most recently, we conducted studies in Missouri and Arkansas when we observed most of the tran disease symptoms in these four main varieties, Vignol, Chambouchen, Norton, Traminet. And actually, we proved how some of these varieties were highly susceptible. Sorry for the, the slide is a bit busy, but here you can see the four different cultivars. These are all the different species we found in Missouri and Arkansas that we artificially inoculate healthy vines to see the progression of the disease. So we see that after six months inoculated, some of these most virulent pathogens could cause over nine centimeters of discoloration and canker. And so we can see that uh, as happened with uh, Vitis vinifera cultivars, some of these uh, varieties are also highly susceptible. And also the role that abiotic factors play uh, on grapevine tran diseases. So, you know, we need to understand better water stress, nutrient deficiency, overcropping, poor planting condition, and of course, how these environmental factors under these cold, cool regions, like winter, freezing injury, could affect the development of these diseases. So just to finalize, and I think this is very important, I was uh, digging some of the old literature and I came out with this paper from Scorsa in 1984, where they were actually evaluating, you know, the difference of the susceptibility of um, <coughs> um, uh, uh, apricot trees to cytospora, eh, where they were actually inducing freeze injury. And what we could see here is, the mean area of canker, so the length of the canker, when they artificially inoculate different cultivars, it was much higher when those injuries were caused by, by freeze. And so they uh, uh, conclude that injury to the silent death is necessary for reliable infection of cytospora. And, and this is something, for example, that I think is happening in some of the cold regions, that cytospora, for example, uh, we find it more and more on grapes, is usually a fruit tree canker, but here in British Columbia or in Northeast is also a common pathogen associated with, uh, with grapes. So whether the freeze or the, the winter kill injury has an effect on this, uh, I think is worth to uh, study. <coughs> so right now, this is an area where most of the research is, is going to try to understand how all these different uh, abiotic stresses can play a role on disease development. So, as I mentioned before, grapevine trenches are present and important in all these cold regions, 
And we need to continue to create this awareness and continue the research to better understand, you know, how these diseases are developing in these specific areas to be able to develop effective control strategies. So I think I have it here until the break. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you for that uh, really informative overview there. So we actually already have a few questions lined up, but just for anybody else who might have a question, if you want to ask it, you can put that in the Q&A bar, which you'll see at the bottom bar. And just as a side note, if you have your hand raised, I actually can't call on you. So if you do have a question, um, just go ahead and put that also in the Q&A bar, please. So one, um, one question that you sort of touched on a little bit already that a couple of people asked was about resistance in either native or interspecific hybrids. And I know you, you sort of touched on that a little bit, but if you had anything else to add to that question. So, so right now we, we don't have any scientific proof that uh, we have any variety resistant to grapevine trans diseases. Uh, neither Vitis vinifera nor some of the interspecific hybrids or even some of the na native uh, grapes. We don't have any, uh, any data on that. We have seen significant difference in susceptibility. Uh, and we know, for example, within Vitis vinifera cultivars, uh, a wide range of susceptibility. For example, in white cultivars, uh, were conducted in Australia, New Zealand, so Sauvignon Blanc to be one of the most acceptable. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Chardonnay also is highly susceptible. And other, other varieties like, for example, uh, Merlot or Pinot Noir could be less susceptible, but still they, they can get the disease uh, and develop the disease. So right now we don't have any information on, on full resistance to these pathogens. And there is not too much done on these specific um, hardy varieties. Uh, it's very, very little uh, done. Uh, so we, we don't have really too much information on that. Okay, thanks. And then another question, um, whether the pathogen in young vines can sort of lay dormant for a while and then start to impact vine health at some point later, or is it something that's gonna happen right away? Yeah, so I will touch a little bit uh, on that later on, on the management and how we try to help uh, nurseries to manage. But this is a, this is a new, well, I wouldn't say new, but a, a recent area of research where we are focusing because we, we observe that we are able to isolate many of these pathogens from asymptomatic uh, uh, boot. Uh, we see healthy uh, planting material, healthy vines coming from from the nursery that we are able to, to isolate these pathogens. So we believe that they may be uh, latent or, or acting as uh, endophytes until some stress factor uh, happen that they become virulent to the plant. So this is, uh, as I mentioned before, this is an area of research where we want to understand more what all these stress factors can be associated with the disease development, whether it is you know, water stress, nutrient stress, winter uh, injury. Uh, this is something that we are actually uh, focusing our research, not only me, but other groups uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, one other question that's come up a couple times from different people is, because this is sort of a, a suite of different species or different, um, different pathogens that are causing the d disease, whether there is a good resource available to diagnose which fungus is causing and specifically whether there's a molecular marker to differentiate um, some of the more common species from, from other ones. So until, until recently, and that's what I saw in that slide, you know, in 2000, we knew about 50 different species associated with uh, the complex of trans diseases. Right now we are over 130 a species we have found and, and associated to the complex. And that's the, the reason why we have uh, molecular tools these days that we are able to separate uh, based on DNA species from each other that um, taxonomically or how they look, this fungi on a, on a growing media, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't do it. One of the main problems we have with this disease for diagnostic is because we have so many different pathogens, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to find a multiplex diagnostic tool that can give us um, a screen of all these pathogens. 
We have recently developed a molecular tool, and I will mention again later, it's, it's called DNA macroarray, where we actually develop a molecular tool allow us to screen for up to 70 different uh, fungi in one test. So we can have a result if the plant is infected and we can screen up to 40, 70 different pathogens in, in one test. So diagnostics are really, really developing and become better tools uh, to help us. But I still, one of the main things we face is the, the, the large amount of pathogens that, that, that we have with these diseases. But we are getting there. We are, we are getting better and better in, in diagnosing and being able to detect all these different pathogens, including even in a single test. Okay, great. Um, we have a, a lot more questions, but I think maybe in the interest of time, um, a lot of them have to do with sort of management, and I'm wondering if you might answer some of them if, as we go along. So maybe okay. if you want to keep going, and then we'll try to get to a few at the end. Perfect. So I'm going to continue then with uh, what I think is very important and critical, which is understanding, you know, the key factors for developing an effective control. And I think it's very important to understand how the disease uh, works, uh, how the pathogen is in our environment, where are the source of the pathogen, how they are spread, because these are going to be, uh, this is going to be information that we are going to put to work to develop our best strategies. So um, in terms of the epidemiology of the grapevine trans diseases, we need to understand, as I mentioned before, sources of pathogen inoculum, where, you know, the inoculum is coming from, and we already mentioned that this inoculum can come uh, from infected nursery material, uh, how the pathogens disperse, and which environmental factors favor this pathogen release or infection. And in this, we have done a lot of work, and it has been done a lot of work on identifying the inoculum uh, in the field and try to identify these low or high periods of infection throughout the year that are gonna give us you know, the, the optimum times for, for control. Host response to the pathogen is very important, you know, how uh, seasonal susceptibility of the grapevine pruning guns, and I will talk to uh, about this, uh, and how we can use this in our favor to minimize uh, infection. And also very important, and that's why these diseases are so complex and difficult to control. We have many different alternate hosts that this fungi can cause similar symptoms. These are cankers caused on cherry, on apple, so we have, you know, for example, for your type of uh, lata, it has over 80 different hosts, uh, uh, booty perennials or even um, native plants that can be a source of inoculum. So this is the epidemiology uh, life cycle uh, overall of uh, grapevine trans disease. So we have the infected areas, symptomatic areas of the plant. In this part, we can find the fruiting bodies where the spores are inside. These spores are released into the environment and it will depend on environmental factors like temperature, uh, relative humidity, rainfall. So these spores, you know, they infect pruning guns and then the disease start progressing. The fungus start progressing inside the vascular system, uh, creating and closing the, the life cycle. So the localization of the fruiting bodies, as I mentioned before, uh, these are, for example, Phymoniella chlamydospora fruiting bodies. We can find it embedded in the bark. These are electron microscope pictures of these fruiting bodies. We can see this kind of flux, uh, say, with the hole, or we call ostiol, where all the spores are going to be uh, ejected. Um, I'm going to play a video, and I'm not sure you will be able to hear the, the, the noise, but it's going to give you a good overview of how the, the life uh, cycle of, of these pathogens work. Jose? Yeah. Yeah, there's a little pop-up thing that says Drobo on your screen. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's see if I can play the video. Now. So this video was uh, done by one of my colleagues, and is currently the extension specialist at UC Davis, Dr. Akif Escalen, and have greatly... Um, share the video with us. So this is just, you know, one of the vineyards in uh, California. We can see some of this overhead irrigation. And those are the areas where we are going to start finding the fruiting bodies of trans diseases. We are going to see now in the cordons, you know, in some of the areas where we have all pruning wounds, 
cracks, uh, canker may be developing underneath. We are gonna see these fruiting bodies uh, emerging. Environmental conditions are critical. Here is the fruiting body embedded in the bark. And you can still see these little holes here I mentioned before where the spores will be ejected. So when the fungus um, sends optimum conditions for a spread, those spores will be ejected to continue the life, the life cycle. So this is the amount of spores created at the end of this fruiting body. And we can see the amount of thousands of spores that they are ejected. Cool. And they can get spread through, through, uh, through the vineyard. So as I mentioned before, these are the areas where you know, the, inoculum, uh, the source of inoculum, these fruiting bodies can be observed. We have seen the, the case with the uh, Salmonella chlamydospora. These are, for example, Phacremonium minimum. It's a different type of uh, uh, fruiting body. Uh, you can see here these long necks with a hole at the end with the spores are getting uh, ejected. So this is the main difference between what we call sexual and asexual fruiting body. The sexual fruiting body, the spores are with thine and ascos, eh, and you will see how eh, this works, for example, in this other video. These are the peritisia, the fruiting body of Pacremonium minimum, and how the spores are ejected. So this is the end of this um, long neck I showed you before, and we can see here how the spores are inside a little sac that we know as uh, ascos. In each of these sacs, it will be eight spores, and this is characteristic of this uh, type of fungi. And the same, when the, the fungus uh, sends the optimum conditions for survival of the spores, they will be ejected. And due to a different pressure within and outside uh, the fruiting body, the sacs break, and all the spores get, you know, dispersed. So these spores can be dispersed with the wind, uh, with the rain droplets, and some studies recently had even shown that insects can carry some of these spores on, the, uh, on their legs. These spores can also travel very long distances. Some studies in California show you type of dieback can travel over 80 kilometers uh, distance uh, carried by the wind. There you go. So many different uh, studies uh, trying to understand the epidemiology have been done uh, around the world, and actually some of them in, in some of the cool uh, uh, regions. So basically what we are trying to understand is, the, um, I don't know if I am, okay, now. Now, trying to understand, you know, the, the, the pathogen uh, throughout the growing season. This is some studies conducted in California between 2006 and 2008. Here you have uh, in blue precipitation, in red you have the temperature, and every bar is the amount of spore of Botryosferia we were catching in this case in the vineyard in Napa. So in California we saw that more than 60% spore release was from late November eh, until uh, February. Then usually we have another release of spores in, um, either in the, in the fall or early spring. But basically, during the dry summer periods, we didn't have any spore release. And similar results uh, have been observed in great growing regions uh, with similar uh, environmental conditions in Chile and, and South Africa. So this is one of the information that is used to try to develop uh, some of the management strategies. For example, it's known that in California, late pruning can help to diminish uh, uh, infection because if we are able you know, to prune later than the main period of uh, a spore release, which happens usually in the winter, uh, we are then uh, exposing those wounds to a period of time which must less inoculum. However, this is not the same in all the regions, and this is a study on spore trapping done in France, and contrary than in California, here most of the the spore release on Botryosferia species were fine during the vegetative period, the spring, summer, and autumn. And so a completely different situation than observed in California. 
We have been conducting recently a lot of studies in British Columbia, trying to understand, you know, the release and of the spores in the environment under our conditions. And you can see here the example of one of the uh, vineyard we have in the southern part of the valley, uh, with three years of data. Here we have the amount of Botryosphaeria spores in columns, temperature, and we have the precipitation. So we could see that under our conditions, the first spore release happened usually uh, at the end of um, winter, early spring. We have a big discharge of spores almost every year between May and June. And what we have seen is not a real direct correlation with precipitation. We have seen a better correlation with temperature, actually. And is when temperatures get about five, six, or eight degrees Celsius when we start seeing all the release of these spores. We barely eh, trap any spores during the winter uh, times, you know, with temperatures below uh, zero and most of our precipitation in forms of snow. And as I will mention before, we are actually using this information we have here to see how we can manage our pruning under busy conditions to minimize the infection. In New Zealand, for example, contrary to what happened, for example, in uh, California, Europe, or even in British Columbia, they observe a sports of Botryosphaeria during the entire growing uh, year, basically. These are results from May 2008 to April 2009, in every single month through the year, they were able to capture a species of Botryosphaeria, okay? independent, basically, of temperature and precipitation. There have been done studies in cold regions, for example, in New York and Michigan. Okay? Those are studies uh, in New York in the 80s uh, by Pearson. And they saw that in this region, Utaipa, uh, Lata was mainly trapped in March, April, similar in, in Michigan. So those were the, the main time uh, where the spores were released in, uh, under those conditions. Another thing I mentioned is the importance of the host response to pathogen and how long these pruning wounds are going to be susceptible to infection since we prune. These are results from some studies that we conducted in California. Here we have a Chardonnay, uh, the month of December. So here what you see is the time zero is the day we prune uh, that vineyard or a, a certain amount of vines in that vineyard. We have an artificial inoculation the same day we prune, and then we came back and inoculate more uh, bones 12, 24, 36, and 40 days uh, later of the first pruning. So we can see here that, you know, the, the day after pruning, we have up to 80% infection in December. And we see how the susceptibility of these wounds decrease, you know, with the, the length of time. But still, after 48 days, we were still having uh, pruning wounds were, were susceptible. Contrary, if we prune in February under California conditions, the first pruning we do, uh, inoculating the day after, we saw a significant reduction, up to 40%, almost 50% reduction in susceptibility of these pruning wounds. And the pruning wounds are still susceptible up to over three weeks, but we can see that after three weeks pruning in February, those wounds are having even almost less than 10% infection. So usually the susceptibility of the pruning wounds decrease with the length, and the closer we prune with uh, warmer conditions, those wounds are gonna heal faster. These are some studies we have conducted here in British Columbia, and we have a seasonal susceptibility to Botryosphaeria species. We have a Chardonnay block that we inoculated with Neofusicocum parvum, one of the Botryosphaeria species. And we inoculate in March. Based on our sport trapping studies, the first big sport release we have observed in British Columbia starts in, in, in mid to end March. So what we have here are the pruning days. So we prune vines December 15, January 15, February 15, March 15, and then in March 16, we went and artificially inoculate all the pruning was done at the different times. So we could see here that the earlier we were pruning in British Columbia were able to have a significant reduction of infection versus, for example, when we were pruning in February or March, we were closer to the inoculation date. Now, for example, a, a inoculation in April, so same, we were uh, conducting uh, pruning in December, January, February, and March, April 15, our last pruning, and then we will come April 16, 
and artificially inoculate all these pruning groups. So we could see that, for example, in this case, early pruning in December was giving us almost 50% less infection. Interestingly, in January, we obtained le uh, almost 80% less infection than if we were pruning, for example, in April. So most of our pruning here in British Columbia, I would say, would start at the end of February, mostly March. So we are seeing here that the closing we are pruning uh, to our time of the spores are available in the environment, we are going to have a higher susceptibility of our pruning wound. So we are continuing with these studies and we are basically evaluating if early pruning under our conditions can be a situation we can minimize infection. These are some studies conducted in, in Michigan against Utai Palata, and you can see here how, you know, the time that they get most infection on the pruning wounds were when they were pruning March, April, or May in 1978, uh, and in this case, they got up to 40% infection when they were pruning in February uh, under Michigan conditions. This is uh, um, all studies, but the Hunting methods here, they observe is that the, the, the temperature after pruning was critical for this pruning wound susceptibility. And they showed that the greater the percentage of two weeks period following pruning and inoculating, that the temperature was five degrees or lower, the less was the resultant percentage of infection, which is very similar to what we have been observing here in British Columbia. We start seeing a higher discharge of spores when our temperatures start getting about five, six degrees Celsius. So we have seen that the epidemiology of grapevine trans diseases is a very important thing to study, and it's very important because it's going to be region or area dependent. So you cannot just look what is happening in other places and try to assume that the same conditions are going to apply to your vineyard. For example, some of the things I saw when I moved here to British Columbia from California were that many growers were doing late pruning because it's a technique that in California has shown successful to minimize infection by um, uh, trans diseases. However, in California, uh, most of the uh, late spring, summer is dry period. We don't have those spores in the environment. Here in British Columbia, our main rainy season is May and June. So this late pruning is not gonna uh, really help because we saw that most of our uh, spores are actually happening during that time. So to finalize, we are going to go with the management of grapevine trans diseases, and I will talk a little bit about the chemical, biological, and the cultural practices. So as I mentioned before, one of the things we thought that we were observing these outbreaks since early 2000 was the prohibition or phase out of some of these chemicals. In Europe, sodium arsenide was widely used to control uh, ESCA, mostly in France and some of the Mediterranean countries. But the product was, uh, it was very efficient to control ESCA, but uh, due to health uh, and environment issues was banned in early 2000. Then we all know the phase out of Venomil in 2001 that actually saw very good control of Utai Palata. And we have actually studies uh, conducted in um, California, New York, where you know Venomil was successfully controlling Utai Palata, or most recently in South Africa. However, this product is, it has been phased out. And now we are facing another problem, which is the re-evaluation of many pesticides. Uh, this is just a website I put here for information of all the different chemicals that are under re-evaluation here in Canada. Uh, whether we are going to lose them or not, uh, the decision has to be made. But we are seeing um, most of this chemistry efficient that we are actually uh, losing it. So some of the priorities, of course, has been to find these uh, new controls and effective controls. Uh, because currently we don't have any systemic product available, you know, to stop the infection inside the boot. So most of the research is focusing on pruning gun protection and cultural practices. So in terms of pruning gun protection uh, against ESCA, you type and Motrosferia dieback, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit of work we uh, did in California uh, where chemical products have been registered. I'm not promoting VLOG, but this is one of the Products that you know came uh, thanks to the, the research conducted in Dr. Google's lab by Phyllis Rohausen. So we observed that pains and uh, pains were very effective uh, if a fungicide was incorporated. However, of course, they need to be applied by hand and can result in significant economic costs. So uh, after working for a few years with paste uh, and pains, we moved for what the industry was um, uh, uh, the industry wanted, which was a, a spray application. 
Uh, of course, you know, uh, possibility to treat large acreage in less time, cost effective. We actually have the possibility to treat uh, several times if needed. Uh, so a lot of work has been done in trying to re uh, obtain information, you know, for registration of these new products and the best uh, application methods against these diseases. So this is some work we conducted in, in California. Eh? We were testing different active ingredients against Utai palata and Lacidiploia theobromate, two of the most common trans diseases in California. So here you see the, the check, the control. So these wounds were not treated, only, only inoculated with the pathogen. So we obtained 90% infection for the Lacidiploia, uh, over 40% for Utaipa. So we could see different results, you know, with different products. And overall, for example, theophanate methyl worked pretty good for both uh, Lacidiploia theodromate Utai palata. We have ciproconazole plus idiocarp, pretty good for Utai palata. And boric acid uh, in a paste, you know, which it became to the b -log, was very good for Utai palata. This is one of the main problems we had with grapevine trans diseases. We had such a large a number of different pathogens that it's gonna be very difficult to find just one chemical or compound that is gonna affect or control all at the same time. And this is one of the major challenges we are seeing. So thanks to some of the work conducted, you know, uh, a lot of materials have been registered and this is just a list of some of the materials and active ingredients in California to control grapevine trans diseases for pruning and protection, both chemical as well as uh, biological or organic. Uh, and most of this information you can find in the IPM um, uh, summary uh, by the UC Davis IPM uh, that most of these um, um, registered products are, are there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention a little bit of the work we are conducting in Canada because one of the main problems is we currently have no product registered in Canada to control grapevine trans diseases. So part of what we wanted to do in, in, in our lab to assist the industry is to try to, to develop or create this uh, information, uh, this data to register products. So our first approach was to focus on products that they were registered in Canada, either in other crops or also registered on grapes. So for example, a label extension could be easily uh, done. Or we were also testing other products that we know they are working very good in, in other regions and we would like actually to bring here registration. So this is just the list of products we were, we were working on. So we develop, uh, well, I, I, I cannot say develop, we modify um, a, a detached can assay, a, a, a way to artificially inoculate uh, dormant canes. And this is um, a very nice way we can treat many, many number of canes, you know, we are talking here 12 different products with 10 different pathogens. So when you start doing all your repetitions, we were over 3000 canes that we can actually put in a greenhouse. These are uh, greenhouse beds, the stereophan. These canes, as you can see, are going through the stereophan. There is water below. We can keep these canes alive for up to six months. So we apply the product, we want to test, we come back and artificially inoculate and we assess the different products, how they perform. So this is a very good system uh, that allows us to screen products before moving into the field. So some of the results we say, observe, these are the different species we had uh, inoculated, all the different products. So I'm only showing results with more than 60% control. And we can, for example, produce like a beauty seal, that's an organic product registered in, in California and uh, very good results for some of the ESCA, young vine decline species. We have gill seal and green seal, which are a tebuconazole based product. Eh? They are the one giving us the best performing results um, uh, across all the different pathways with actually even 100% control. However, I have to say that in some of these that you see that they, they are not performing well or they are not working, we have to consider that we are inoculating these pruning goods with significant amount of spores. More spores than naturally, you know, would happen in the environment. So we are really challenging these, these uh, boons to obtain uh, infection. So actually, some of these products that it says that here may not work, if we reduce the amount of spores, we will give us actually a, a, a better control. 
But of course, you know, uh, until until now, most of the research in controlling trans disease have been focusing one application of the product, you know, uh, either in a paste or in a spray. But as we have shown with our uh, epidemiological studies, we see that spores are present during large time of our growing season. Uh, so we need actually to be sure that the application is going to cover most of the period where our spores are present, or we may need more than one application. So this is some of the work we have been conducting here in British Columbia. And here is, for example, with one of the products that were performing best in our greenhouse trial, the buconazole. So we have here natural. Basically, uh, we didn't find any, any of the comparable in our natural uh, canes. This is the check you know, non-treated but inoculated. So we obtained almost 100% infection. And what we did is we treated and inoculated 24 hours. Another set of boons were inoculated seven days later and another set of boons were inoculated 21 days later. So we were seeing the effect of the active ingredient over time. Of course, when we apply the pruning gun protectant and we artificially inoculate right after, we observe 100% control. But this control or the activity of the active ingredient in the pruning gun will decrease over time. Uh, with 21 days, we still were getting 80 per, almost 80% control. So it's still a significant amount of control uh, 21 days later. So this is telling us that maybe for some of these products, we are going to need more than one application uh, to cover the time that the pathogen is in the, in the environment. Another example with the biological control of trichoderma, a little bit of a different um, results. We have after 24 hours of applying the trichoderma inoculating, very low control and much higher control, almost the same control 21 days later than a chemical product uh, with the trichoderma. We know the way trichoderma works, it needs time to colonize the, the whole pruning wound. Uh, so actually, 24 hours or even seven days probably was not enough for this species to totally uh, colonize the boon. But after 21 days, the results of them were quite, quite significant, quite good. So now we are working on generating this uh, uh, product registration. We are conducting field trials uh, and the idea is hopefully bringing some of the registration here to, uh, to Canada for growers to be able to control uh, these diseases. So finishing here, cultural practices, vineyard sanitation, this is nothing new. Uh, we need to keep all the infected symptomatic boot away of our vineyard. As I mentioned before, in all these areas are where we are gonna find our fruiting bodies with the spores. So we need basically to try to eliminate the inoculum outside of our vineyard. This is uh, always not a good idea to leave all this uh, pruning or, or vines close to the vineyard. If permitted, uh, growers uh, burn uh, this. Or the, the idea is to try to take it away from the vineyard to avoid that the inoculum can come back again um, to our current vineyards. So remedial surgery, another uh, technique long time known and, and used where we are actually uh, eliminating the boot until we see healthy boots. So the idea is to try to remove the infected parts of the of the vine until we find healthy boot and retrain the vine to continue production. So this is just an example here in a demonstration how we have been cutting the trunks. Uh, we still see here the canker. We keep going down until no canker or no symptoms are almost observed. You know we have here, for example, one of the uh, uh, shoots to retrain maybe the vine. And we apply, you know, a paste to cover this boon so it's not going to get infected. So this is commonly done, you know, uh, in, it has been done in large acreage areas. It can have some advantages and disadvantages, you know. Advantages, we can retrain the clone uh, that many times, for example, is maybe even not available. We already have a very well-developed root system, so these vines are going to grow faster and enter in production sooner. Uh, and of course, higher success if the vines are self-rooted. Yeah? <clears throat> it has been work conducted. The amount of shoots we obtain from self-rooted vines versus grafted vines is much higher. Disadvantages is labor intensive, it's highly cost, and of course, it's better results if done during dry season period, which is not always possible, as most of this work is done by the time we conduct uh, the, the pruning. 
So very interesting work conducted in Australia by my colleague, Marcel Snowski. And when you are conducting remedial surgery, it has been a work, where should you cut the vine? Should you cut at the top? Should you cut at the middle? Should you cut at the bottom? Should you start going um, little by little until you find a uh, healthy wood? So here are a trial that they were cutting the vines in 2002, and they have these different cuts. They have a top cut, a middle cut, and a bottom cut. In 2004, two years after cutting, you can see this vine is still uh, producing. 2007, five years after cutting, this vine was completely dead. However, as you can see in the back, the vine that was retrained all the way to the bottom, five years after, is still healthy and continue producing. So if this work is going to be conducted, it's expensive work, it's uh, time consuming. Uh, uh, Australians have shown that it's better to go all the way to the bottom that of course you're going to have a much uh, success uh, to find healthy wood that if you just cut uh, at the top which probably the canker here was already uh, uh, going farther the cut. I'm going to finish a little bit uh, with the control of grapevine transitions in the nursery and this could be another topic for an entire hour uh, but what I'm basically giving you here is a very good review uh, that is a lot of information about how uh, these uh, pathogens are working on the nursery material and some of the different control strategies that nursery are using to, to control these uh, diseases. So just to give you a little bit of what we have done here in British Columbia, this is the DNA macroarray I was mentioned to you before. It's a molecular tool we have developed that we are able to screen more than 70 different pathogens in just one test. So we were con, uh, collecting samples from different areas of the uh, grapevine material from two different nurseries and using the DNA macroarray to assess which pathogens uh, we found. So uh, I would say it was, it was quite surprising to see the amount of uh, percentage of pathogens. For example, 92% of those plants would have a black food uh, pathogen, Bacteria macrodidima. 70% of those plants would have a Botrysphaeria species. Phymoniella, uh, even Fusarium, and this is why we have been starting doing some work trying to understand if Fusarium species could be also involved in this complex. But you can see uh, the different amount of species we actually found uh, in, in, in plant uh, nursery material. However, as I mentioned before, and this is a clear example of what we are seeing, healthy nursery material, we can see here no uh, necrosis, none of the vascular symptoms. We were able to identify this jump and decline species, including Botrysphaeria species. We have another sample eh, with symptoms eh, that we were actually eh, isolating similar diseases. So this is what we are thinking and now, and we are conducting research to understand if many of these pathogens are latent or are part of the microbiota uh, of the plant, and is after some of these stress factors that can become uh, virulent. So this is a, a lot of research actually uh, we are conducting right now to understand how this stress may affect the development of the disease. So management of grapevine trans diseases, you know, is complex, but it's possible. Uh, we cannot find just a silver bullet. Uh, it has to be, we believe it has to be an integrated pest management uh, approach with cultural practices, responsible chemical control, biological control. But it's very important, as I mentioned, to try to understand how the disease works under our specific conditions. Um, and as I mentioned before, that's why it can be a region specific. So to finalize, I give you here, uh, we published this paper recently, early this year. It's a review paper with uh, my colleagues from Spain and Australia, where we have put you know, uh, more than 30 pages of uh, information about how to manage trans diseases. And again, as I mentioned today, how important it is to understand these two factors uh, for a successful management. I cannot leave uh, today without promoting. Uh, I'm hosting next year uh, here in beautiful British Columbia. Here is our fantastic Okanagan Lake, the Grapevine uh, Trans Disease Workshop, where international scientists, industry members, stakeholders will come uh, to share and to show the latest uh, research information on trans diseases. So, uh, I invited you all to come and visit us uh, next July here in, in British Columbia and here in this website you can find all the information. 
And finally, of course, I have to thank for the invitation, Dr. Tim uh, Martinson. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to give this presentation in this uh, webinar. Uh, it has been uh, a pleasure. And of course, thank you to all my team uh, that makes all the, the work we do um, possible and all of you for being there and, and listening to me. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Jose Ramon. That was um, really interesting. I think you've actually managed to touch on a lot of the questions that people had, but we will get to a few if you still have time sure. yeah, to have. answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we move on to the questions, I just want to make a couple of quick announcements for anybody that does have to leave um, now. And one of those is that we're going to be posting, we're, we've recorded this webinar, and so we'll be posting that if you want to go back and listen to any part again, or if you had to have to duck out early and you want to hear the questions at the end, um, we'll post this and we'll send out an email once we have that online. So you can, um, you can definitely go and check that out. And also, for any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask, I'm going to put um, Jose Ramon's email in the chat bar. So yeah. uh, you can go, you can always email him afterwards if you have you, any further you questions. May, you may need to go back to the presentation and, and try to understand better my Spanglish. So. <laughs> no, it was great. It was perfectly understandable. Um, so one question, and you sort of touched on parts of this, but uh, Dr. George Lovett had a question about some of the different um, different methods of sort of dealing with um, with diseased vines, for instance, um, using those pruning wound paints, which can be successful, but um, often it can be costly and, and labor intensive. Um, also retraining new canes to replace dead dying cordons is expensive. Um, he mentions that in the Northeast, sometimes growers will use multiple trunks and then cut off the um, older trunks as they become infest infected. And then also uh, you mentioned the Australian technique of cutting off the whole vine at the bottom and then retraining another bilateral cordon a year later. So he asks, which technique would you recommend? Is there one, one of those practices that you see as standing out as better than the rest? So, so thanks, George. Um, I, I worked with George for with, with many years and I learned a lot from George. He was uh, with Dr. Buller, uh, my, my, my mentor during my years in California. We travel all around California, so it's glad to see. He wants to give me some hard time here with some questions. So uh, <laughs> as I mentioned before, there's no, there not really a silver bullet to control these diseases. Uh, one of the things we have observed is we know that the, the paints work and work well, mostly when you apply a fungicide uh, on it. But um, the, the industry basically came to us saying it's, it's very costly to apply this, uh, these paints. You have to go by hand. Uh, each pruning has to be painted. So um, I would say that um, at the end of the, but by 2007, 2008, we, we basically started to, to work more in trying to find products that we can spray, that we can add to the, to the tank and, and, and spray and get a, a coverage of those pruning goods. So that's, in terms of pruning goods with chemicals, that's where the industry wants to go right now with the spray of the material more than with paints. Still, there are uh, vineyards and there are wineries that they can still afford to paint and they are painting. Um, sometimes the paint, and I would think in some of our conditions, the problem is with, with the, the cold weather or the, or the rain, it can be cracked, you know, it has been shown not to, to be so, so efficient. Uh, and the most important thing, as we understand now how the epidemiology works, we know that these pathogens are not just once in our vineyard. We know that these pathogens are throughout the throughout a large period of time in the growing season. So giving the opportunity to develop some of these sprays, uh, growers are going to be able to probably, that we think is going to happen, to put more than one application of these sprays. The idea is we are going to have to start thinking in managing clay vine trans diseases as probably we are managing powdery mildew or botrytis. Uh, we have you know, a calendar, we have a sprays that we have to start putting in our pruning guns until we are sure that there are no more um, spores in the environment uh, or the wounds are not susceptible. In terms of the surgery, I think also it's going to depend on your economics. Australians have some very well that if you decide to do a remedial surgery uh, and if your vineyards are mature enough over 10, 15 years old, 
go all the way to the bottom of the trunk. Uh, they have shown that has a much higher uh, success uh, of getting uh, more life out of those vines. And as I saw you in my previous slide, if you start uh, cutting either in the middle or in the bottom, you have a big uh, chance that the, the canker has gone through uh, that cut. So um, the, if you decide to do this work, which is costly, uh, my suggestion is, is go all the way to the bottom. We have some trials here in British Columbia. We started three years ago where we have performed um, cuts all the way to the bottom in entire blocks, actually. And we have seen so far a very successful um, growth and, and retrain of those, of those vines. Okay, thanks. Um, another question that, that's come up a couple times is um, if a grower lost some vines, um, presumably due to winter injury, would it be a good idea to go back and test those for some of the grape trunk vine fun fungi? And if so, how late is too late to do that? Like if it happened last year or a couple of years ago, is it still possible to go back and test? So the, 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 best, the best time for testing um, is when, when we can still see the symptom and we still have live tissue on the vine. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, if I can go back here to some of the, let's see if I can find some of the, some of these cankers, for example, the area where we usually try to isolate and identify the pathogens are the interface between the healthy tissue and the dead tissue. That's where the pathogen is active and the pathogen is still growing and colonizing. So this is the, the area where we use. So if the vine is completely dead and dry, uh, it goes, it's going to be much more difficult to isolate the pathogen. And sometimes some of the fungi we can isolate from these dead areas are actually not maybe the, the cause of the, of, of the canker. There are maybe other colonizers, or as we can see here, some of the bacillomyces coming later. So the best time is not, is not when the vine is dead and entirely dead, when, when, when it's best to test. And when, when we start seeing some of the symptoms I described before, um, all these, um, I think we can have here all the way to the top. Some of these symptoms, we can start seeing some of these spurs positions that they are missing in the vines, some of these areas, that's where we have to start getting this boot and, and send it to, to test to identify those pathogens. It's much, much harder if the entire vine is dead. 